Welcome back. How's that? Is that better? I think you I'm can see it. I'm gonna get my... Hey guys. Big ready to see if, it, if we're not sideways. Jen started it. We've been sideways for a minute. Mm. Now we are, we're good to go. Okay, I think right. we're better. Yay! Are we on there? Yo. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Hey everybody. And we're back. And we are back. <laughs> here I am with water. So finish telling what you were... Okay, so now that we're both here and we're not sideways, I wanted to start this Wednesday off by first saying hi, hope you're having a great week, and then going forward with a gratitude roll call. So in the comments, if you will, post something that you are thankful for. I will start. Today is my mom and stepdad's birthday. Oh, they both have the same birthday, right. which is really cool. I know. And so I want to say happy birthday, mom, and happy birthday, Papa Dave, and I'm very thankful for you. So there we go. So if you want to put something in the comments, that would be awesome. What are you thankful for? What's yours? Gratitude. I am thankful for you being so hot. You're amazing. You look great. What's Excuse up, me, Dr. Sir? Carl? Um, <laughs> uh, that I'm thankful for our family. Thankful for uh, coming out of this uh, sheltering in place stuff that's happening for us. Getting back to how we do things. I think that's something to be very grateful for. And just for my health, being able to get up. I was up early this morning training yesterday, what, 5 a.m. I was the first person to the gym. That was cool. Um, just grateful for a lot of stuff. Grateful for the people here that, that we've been reaching and talking to that are sending us such great messages saying thanks for the insight and, and the things that we're sharing. So, yeah, yeah a lot of cool, a yeah. lot of cool stuff. Super so, cool. Yeah, yeah, so if you will, tell us what you're thankful for. That would be Awesome. Set some good vibes and positive energy out into the Facebook world land. Facebook world land. World land. The world land. It is. And so, I'm trying not to look over here. The camera's over there. I did the that The camera's before. here, not down there. Well, I keep wanting to look that way. You're here. Oh, it's over here. <laughs> yeah. On that side. See, I can touch it right there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, okay. We're here. Right. It's Wednesday. Let's do this. All right. Okay. So, um, this week, we wanted to reach out to our online family here and ask you what topics you would like for us to talk about. What are you looking at me for? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. What topics you would like for us to discuss and touch on, and feel free to comment, feel free to chime in if there's something on this topic that we're talking about. Um, and I want to also commend all of you for sending in something and being very vulnerable about some of your... Um, not, not issues, I don't want to say issues, but some of the things that you want to talk about. Um, because that's, I think, where we start our growth journey is by starting from a place of vulnerability mm -hmm. and recognizing what needs to either change or become better. Hi, Ty. Tell Maddie I said hi. It's my girl hi, now. Ty. Yeah. Um, grateful for family. That's awesome. Yes. So um, I wanted to just commend you all for being very vulnerable and sending us something and you know letting us know that this is where you feel like you need to change or something needs to change get better you know so i love that yeah yeah so if we're ready to roll let's roll i am ready, ready to do it what's up dr tony tony stacy bubba, hey, bubba what's hi. up dude so yeah so, so awesome all right i got it so we people emailed in they asked yeah. the questions you're going to take the questions you're going to share them with me i'm going to answer them try mm -hmm. to shed some light on those few things and then also, Saturday, we're going to be doing another one of these, but we're moving it up an hour, correct? Yeah, really so quick. since tonight, we started an hour earlier for everybody on the East Coast, mm -hmm. so it wasn't so late. And then we also are going to be starting Saturday at 7 instead of 8, that specific time. So then Eastern, that would be 10. 10. What? 10 yes, Eastern. 10, 10 Eastern. Awesome. Okay, yeah. cool. So we'll do that Saturday as well. Yeah. So today, we're going to get to some of the questions. and Yeah, we're going to get to his... There, there was a lot, so we're going to go with, we're going to roll and see what we get to. Okay. And then we're going to hopefully get to the rest of them on Saturday. All so, right. all right. So the first one I thought, I thought personally would be really good to start with because it was a question directed more toward a family dynamic, but I think my opinion of this is that it can go with, it can go along with um, family, team, relationship, intimacy, I think it really can all be rolled into that, but this okay. was directed more toward a family dynamic. Okay. So with that being said, um, the question was how, I have my paper here so I don't mess it up. Um, how do we, can we as people, parents, communicate with children when they are some, maybe somewhat being challenging? Mm -hmm. um, how do we build them up while eliminating or minimizing frustration? So that's kind of a two-part question, I guess. 
Okay. So how do we communicate effectively with them? And which I thought was great because we can take this into any other kind of relationship we're in, business. Okay. You know. As well. Awesome. So yeah. communicate with them and then what what the other don't how build do them we up? build them up while eliminating or minimizing any kind of frustration that might come. Okay. So uh, first thing, so let's talk about how you communicate with when you look at as a child, young person, we have kids, we have two, we have Addison who is 10, about to be 11, we have Kennedy who just turned six. Mm -hmm. So when I'm communicating with them, or I'm teaching and working with a team on how to communicate as well, the biggest thing that you have to incorporate into your interaction with any individual is just simply the word honor. And so honor is this thing where it, it's, it's a context that you set where everything that you speak and everything that you say needs to be filtered through that and the understanding that you are talking to another human being. You're talking to someone who has just as much right to be on this planet, just as much uh, responsibility in growing and using their potential as you did. Uh, they were born with a purpose. They were born with gifts and talents. Always speaking to anyone on the team with honor is the number one priority. Like when you speak, you always have to ask yourself, is what I'm saying honoring of this other human being? I think what happens for us a lot of times, and this I'm just speaking personally for myself, I think what happens a lot of times is we forget that the person that we're speaking to has every bit of right to be on this planet as we do. And so we oftentimes project our own superiority onto someone else, even into our, our children, thinking that you already have it all figured out, that you already know, and it's in, in that's that little bit of a slant towards being condescending, that little bit of a slant towards um, it, it, it verbally it, abusive in a sense. That can happen very quickly if you don't learn to honor and you don't learn to speak to an individual from that set, that context. There's an old saying that, that how we're perceived determines how we're received. And so when I'm speaking to someone on a team, how I am perceived is going to base, be a basis for how they receive what it is that I have to say. And there's a, a thing that I have always remembered in that the man or the woman is more important than the message. And what that means is, is that if a person doesn't accept you, they're going to have a really hard time accepting the message that you share. And so when I'm speaking to my kids, I'm always remembering my children. When I'm speaking to my spouse, when I'm speaking to the people that I work with, I'm always remembering that it's a connection from me with them that lays the groundwork for all the things, the insight or the wisdom, as I would say, um, that it's going to come from. And that, that kind of lays the path. And so without it, many people talk, but very few people communicate. And so in how I communicate with, with my children is that I understand first and foremost that they deserve honor no matter what. Even if they are misbehaving or doing something that I would say is not accurate, it's not right, it's not proper, I can still speak to them in a very honoring way. That's the number one thing for me when I believe you communicate with someone. It's really easy to think that how you see something is accurate. And a lot of times when we speak to people, that's our come from, is that I'm accurate, you're wrong. I have insight that you don't. I know you don't, I'm smart, you're dumb, right? I'm better than you, I'm superior, you're inferior. That approach, I think a lot of times, can cause us to miss the connection that's needed for us to be able to convey an idea or to really share with someone what it is that I hope that they're going to get. And so honor is a big part of a relationship. Honor is a big part of a team. It's the number one thing I think most important for us when it comes to communicating. You know, um, I think in our world right now, people lack honor. They don't understand honor. They don't understand the importance of honor. When you turn on the television, when you look and read a, a news article of all bankers, corporate people, political figures, all these people, they seem so greedy. They seem out for themselves. The problem with that is when a person's really greedy and all they're thinking of themselves is they're not thinking of how to honor other human beings and how to build other people up. And so, you know, Amber just put it on there. Hi, Karen. Happy Karen. Mima. Hi, Karen. Mima. Happy birthday. My mom's on here. Y'all tell her is. happy birthday. Happy birthday. But the, the idea of, of honor, it moves things away from just your perspective. And you are then creating a sense of connection from human being to human being to where you're sharing your insight with that human being versus I know what I know. You should never even ask me why. We shouldn't even talk about this. You just have to trust what I say. And there's times for that. Absolutely. You know, there are times when 
We tell our kids to do something, you know, well, why should I do it? It's like, you, you don't need to ask why right now. You just need to do it. But those, those times are few and far between. And the reason that we, we try not to come from it in that place is because I think they're worthy and deserving of explanation. I think they're worthy and deserving of, of the insight I want to share with them. But it's got to be delivered in a proper way. And I think one of the things that lays the groundwork for really good communication is honor. And I think it's missing in our society. I think it's missing in our culture. People attack anything that they don't understand. And one of the things that, that I'm clear on now is it's really easy to tear something down. It really is. It's hard to build things up, but it's easy to tear something down. And so what we do is we come along and we see what someone's done and it's really easy to pinpoint problems within it, tear it down, poke holes at it, right? It's easy to do that, but you may not understand the process of what all went into building it up and getting it to that place. And so I always try to remember that when I'm communicating with anybody else. It's like, I don't understand everything that's going on behind the scenes. I don't understand all the complexities of an uh, almost 11 year old girl. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the complexities of a six year old. I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know how they're thinking. And so with that, I have to be honoring of that. And so the honor component, I think, really blazes a path for all the good things to be conveyed and then hopefully, hopefully received. And they may not be received. They may not, but I think the thing that, that makes the most amount of differences in that is honor. Uh, and, and one thing, I know you, you had something you wanted to add there. I was trained in doing leadership events and trainings that I did. How I was trained was that you always want to be careful that you don't make another human being wrong. And so in the conveying of an idea, when you make someone else wrong, their programming, their preset, preconditioned impulses of, oh my gosh, uh, I'm already not smart. I'm already not being successful. I'm already not doing it right. The problem with that is when they're thinking that way, when a group of people that I'm standing in front of communicating an idea to, if they're already thinking that way, and most of us do think that way, we think that somebody else has more answers than we do. We think other people are smarter than us. We think other people have more potential than us. Other people had it easier than us. And if we think that, when we're listening to someone talk, that's a lens we listen through, and the moment they say something that causes us to feel like we're not enough or that we're not doing it the right way, sometimes we feel shamed. And we, when you feel shamed, like someone's making you wrong, and that shame is a part of the, the communication, you start throwing up these walls, and that's where communication starts getting broken. And if you, that's why I'm saying you talk, but there's a difference in a person that can talk and a person that knows how to communicate. And communication comes from a heart level connection. And it's really hard to connect with another human when you're shaming them because you think your perspective's right and they're not doing it right. And what I've learned in all the people that I've been speaking in front of and all the trainings is that most people show up in any event thinking that they're probably not doing their life right. And now they may pretend like they are. They may bow up and, and, and act like, you know, I got this thing figured out. But that behavior even is typically driven from a feeling of unworthiness and a feeling of insecurity. And as human beings, so many of us struggle with insecurity. So many of us struggle with this human condition because we don't know how to figure it out. We don't know. And so the last thing we need is somebody to shame us and throw guilt onto us and cause us to feel like we're doing it way worse than we are. That's where I think we lose connection. And so in remembering that as you're speaking to your child, remembering that when you're speaking to your spouse, Remembering that when you're speaking to your team, your family, your friends, is that, hey, wait, I need to be careful here that I don't make this person wrong. Because what, what I know to be very true is that none of us have all the answers. And, and I just saw something to where when a person is not intelligent, right, when they're not really intelligent, they tend to, to posture themselves as they are really intelligent. But incredibly intelligent people realize that they don't know anything. Because the more information they get, they realize the more they need more information and that there's more information out there. I think it was Aristotle that says, the more I learn, the more I realize I know nothing. And that's a powerful place to stand in. It doesn't mean you don't stand for certain values. It doesn't mean you don't speak your truth. But you speak your truth and stand for these values very carefully and very cautiously. Because once you make somebody wrong and they feel shamed, you're done. You're done. The, the connection with them, it's over. And, you know, that's, that's something that most people don't consider when they talk to other people. So, yeah, and I think, was that okay? Yeah, was that okay? 
Was that okay, you guys? <laughs> wow. Um, the one thing that came to mind when you were saying all this was we tend to focus so much more on the actual challenge or the problem mm -hmm. than we do the actual person. Um, and I think finding ways to honor the person and understanding that the challenge comes from not knowing or the, that person not knowing what to do, that they're probably just as confused as you would be. They're, like you said, there's, there's, no, there's no manual to any of this. And you've even said this to Addison before because she's really starting to comprehend some more complex ideas is you've even said, you know what, I'm sorry. I've never been a dad to a 10 year old before. And that's so true. You have to give yourself a little bit of grace and I'll you have that. to be, yeah, I'm you said that. that. And so we'll also, I also would like to bring up the little bit of maybe the conversation that you and Addison had the other night, because I think that it was probably very profound for yours and her relationship. Mm -hmm. And none of us get this right at all. We are only just doing the best that we know to do. And I think that's the same, that, that's the case with kids. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, I mean, especially when you get into the teenage years or whatever, I'm just speaking maybe for myself, but you're confused. Like things are changing and you have no idea what to do, where to go with it, what your thoughts are. Like there's so much that you feel is so out of control when you're a child. And if, I don't know. I don't know if this is complete. I'm completely off. But mm -hmm. if a parent is focusing so much on the actual challenge or the problem itself instead of the person and honoring and building up the person, giving that little person grace and that they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But then also from a vulnerability standpoint of I don't know what I'm doing either as a parent. Well, Does that you're make doing sense? really good. Yes, but so there's a difference between mindfully advising and manipulating. Now, of course, we're That's manipulating. Good. Okay, in any way, you're trying to manipulate a, a circumstance to produce a result. So in some ways, when you're parenting, yes, you are manipulating because you see things from a viewpoint or a vantage point that your child does not, right? And, but this is true in any endeavor with any other human being. You said children, we're all just grown up kids. Yeah. The problems with, with the, that is so real for so many of us is we carry the residue of these traumas or these pains that we've felt before and your brain is always looking for ways to avoid any kind of pain. And so when you feel a trauma, you feel rejection, your brain processes feelings, emotional feelings, the same way that it processes physical feelings. And so when you get rejected, that's a physical pain. You, when a person is heartbroken, they have shown that a person feels the same as if their heart was really being broken. That's why that, that term came up, is when a person loses someone that they care about, maybe that they've been abandoned by someone, maybe a relationship didn't work out. That is actual, a, actually a physical pain. Your body processes it the same. And so we try to avoid at all costs pain. And so when we're speaking to our children and we're speaking to other individuals, you must consider, this is what I have to consider, is that on some level, I'm speaking through a filter of pain. And when people are trying to avoid that pain at all, if I'm not careful and I don't handle that very, very strategically and I'm not, not gentle with that, you can wind up doing a lot of damage. And you know, you wind up doing damage, it adds to the trauma of a person, it can add to their residue of emotional baggage that they carry. And so as a parent, I think there's a, a huge responsibility just as is, as they're you okay? Yeah, our chairs are rubbing, making noise, <laughs> making fun. Just you know, just as it, as there's a responsibility in nurturing your team, as there's a responsibility to nurturing your spouse, we have to find out there, there's a responsibility in being a leader of a family or the responsibility of, of leading a team. You have a responsibility to do that, mm -hmm. and there's things that are given to you that have been entrusted to you. And I read a quote that was just a few days ago that leadership is about taking someone not to where it is that they want to go, but where it is that they ought to be. And so when you consider that, you're like, oh, well, they ought to be a person that is not emotionally damaged. They ought to be a person who is not um, anxious and afraid of all things. We, we don't want to raise up children that are timid like because they ought to be bold. I think that they ought to be committed and focused. I think that's a big thing. And so when I'm speaking to my kids or anybody that I coach, it's like, how can we move someone to where they ought to be? Not from manipulation, but from a mindful approach, mindful adjustments in their thinking. And that's, that, that makes all the difference in the world. And so mindfully advising, mindfully making adjustments to where knowing that in the end, this is the result that we would hope for. 
I think in telling a kid, telling your team, you're not trying to tell them what to think. You're simply advising them on how to think. And not everyone knows how to think. They don't. And, and learning how to think is an incredibly challenging and sometimes painful process. Because since our brains deal with the emotion of things and physical pain the same way, when you allow an old belief of yourself to die, it's like you feel and believe like you've lost something. This is why people don't love to change so much because the moment I change, an old belief, an old structure, an old thing that I have built, it dies, it dissolves, and it's almost like we mourn it. And so if I mourn like the loss of who I used to be for five years, if I realize, wait a minute, I thought this about myself for five years and it wasn't true, people are like, oh my God, I don't, I don't wanna let that five years of my life die or, or leave, what would it mean? This is why people honor their grandparents and their great-grandparents' dogma, their religion, their political views, because it's like, well, if I have a different view than that, that would mean that grandpa or grandma or mama or whoever it is didn't exist, and we can't have that. We need to keep them around, so let's honor their belief. And, and you can honor another human being and their beliefs while at the same time not having to necessarily agree with it. But your approach to communicating with that and facilitating a dialogue with that comes from that context of honor. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can, can ever do for another human being is spend time with them enough to offer undivided attention, honor an open, uh, offer an open mind. When you do that, I think people pick up on that and they realize, you know what? This person gives a crap and it's the old saying, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. That's a big thing. And so I'm always trying to show when I'm communicating with someone that I work with, my, my kids, my spouse, I, I care a lot about this. This is important and I'm passionate about it. So please don't misconstrue my passion for control. It's just that I believe that this is worth sharing. And so um, that's kind of the come from on it. So communicating with a kid when they maybe don't act right. Right. Is that, that, that's, I, know you wrote, wrote I did write down. something else down, but it, I mean, I think it kind of goes with what I had said before. And I think sometimes we so easily can um, speak to what they're not doing and how they're not acting. And instead of saying you, you were acting out this way or you should be doing this, then instead flipping it and saying, you know, I, I know you are... A really sweet person and I know that you didn't really mean to say it that way or I'm just giving trying to come up with some examples mm -hmm. of what I'm what I'm talking about just to kind of make it plain and simple but um, instead of say, telling them what they did wrong I feel like as a parent I think it's important to say you know what you're a very encouraging person and you're a very smart person and you're very like tell them what they are and what they're instead of what they're not yes and I think that that just plants so many seeds into them believing it themselves. And once they hear it long enough, they'll believe it about themselves. And then anything that doesn't act according to that, it won't feel right to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You you're, you're speaking to the person, not the problem. Yeah. Right. And so in speaking to the person that comes back to the honor component. And so always that it's, I think that it's very important to speak to the person right, that you are, have been entrusted the responsibility to lead or to guide. I think it's very important to speak to the person ahead of where they are yeah. and to what it is that they can become and what it is that, that they can express and what can be expressed through them versus speaking directly to what it is they're doing wrong because then you nail them to that problem and they start to believe that that's their identity is if they screw up and you're reminding them how much they screw up, they start to think they're a screw up. And that's not, I don't think, how you want to raise people up. I think that, you know, if you do that, you raise up, I think you can raise up very codependent children. I think that, you know, there's something between being dependent, codependent, interdependent. There's different phases of relationship. You don't want to raise up kids that are codependent upon you when they're adults. I think there's a very healthy send-off age, send-off time. And I think people struggle with that. And so speaking to them, building them up into who it is that they could become, who it is that, that you know that they would like to be, and the values that they can express. When you're saying you are very encouraging to our daughter, what you're telling her is that you are this type of person that can encourage and be kind even when maybe you don't feel like it, versus saying you don't ever do this, you don't ever do that. That's what the person hears and that's what is absorbed. And our minds are like these sponges. So we pick up on all that, whether it's conscious or very unconscious, whether it's very intentional or unintentional. And um, that, that's where I think we need to realize that we're molding these, these 
people that will one day become adults that will be the leaders in our world that will then go on and they will reproduce again. Our children will have children probably and then their children will have children. And so we need to speak to our, our children in a way that we are at least cognizant of that and, and considering that they're not going to be these little children forever. And so when I talk to my kids, I don't necessarily talk to them like they're children. I speak to them as if they are adults. I speak to them in a way that I would want someone to speak to me to engage my thinking, you know, because if you speak to them as a kid, it's, you know, it's like pastors of a church. If you're always talking to people about how they're broken, they're busted, and they got nothing, then that's who's always going to be listening to you. You know, if you want different people listening to you, you got to change your language. You got to change what you're talking about. You got to change your message. And I think I always try to remember that. And so in speaking to our kids, it's, it's speaking to them in, into who it is they can become versus mm -hmm. what, what you said is the, the negative thing that they're maybe doing wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I had mentioned earlier something about a conversation that you had the other night with Addie, our 10 year old, and something came up and it was, I think, stemmed from just something that we noticed. And so he called her in here to actually into his office where we are and I I could tell that that was gonna be this was gonna be a little bit of like a uh, for lack of better words come to Jesus kind of meeting <laughs> you know okay. what I mean and what do you mean by come to Jesus <laughs> like uh we're gonna we're gonna get down to the nitty-gritty on this you know mm -hmm. we're gonna we're gonna uncover some layers here and figure out where this is stemming from mm -hmm. and we'll work from there okay so I would like for you to as much as you would like um, share a little bit of the story of the other night because I would even kind of peep my head around just to see like if I needed to help with anything or be a part and I was like you know what this is this is something I think needs to just be left alone and you know you can you can take it from there and I just I, I stayed out of it because I felt like it was a really good in-depth conversation that you guys were having together yeah so it was a two-hour conversation we started at about seven we finished at about nine because it was time for her to go to bed and I can remember traveling with with my mentor mr. Clemmer that I worked for for many years and he would be teaching me something late and it would be like midnight and we'd be sharing a, a hotel suite and we'd be sitting in the the, the common area there on the sofa and he'd be talking to me about some leadership module or some way of thinking and it'd be midnight and I was just tapped out like I was done and I remember doing an event one time with him we were doing a, a training together and he had shared something with me late that night that he wanted me to talk about the next morning but because I was completely tapped out I didn't remember it and so the next morning he goes alright I want you to get up there and talk about the thing we talked about last night and I was completely oblivious to it. Like I didn't remember it. I, I had no I had no bandwidth for it because of, of how late it was. And so if it weren't for it getting so late the other night, the conversation would have continued on later into the night. But we talked about how lenses are what drive every single decision that we make in our life. And that everything we see, we, th we see through a lens. Now, these are things that I learned 10, 11 years ago when I first started doing the leadership transformational thought stuff in that everything that we look at, we look at through a lens. And we tend to find things that we're looking for. And so once I believe something and I have decided to think that as a truth, then what I'm looking for is something to justify what I've already made up. And so if I make up a truth about someone that they don't care about me or they don't value me or that they're not intelligent or intelligent or they don't have what it takes or they don't honor me or whatever that is, once I've decided that, once I've decided that's just one lens, that's what I tend to look for. And not only that, I behave based on lenses. And so if I'm dishonoring of a human being, then it's because I believe on some level that that person is, is, should be dishonored. And it all stems from a belief. And a lot of times we don't know where it is that we get these beliefs from. And so Addison and I, we sat, we had a really great conversation on it. And it had to do with, with some interaction between Addison and her younger sister, Kennedy. And I said, you know, when you see something that you say you don't like, immediately, because there's an emotion that goes along with this first thought, when you merge thought and emotion, your brain says, well, this is the reality of it. And in fact, that's not true at all. Emotions are unbelievably unpredictable. And, and typically we feel chemicals, emotions, based on something that we ate, something we watched the night before, what we've been listening to, who we've been letting speak into our life. And so if I see something and I say I don't like it and there's an emotional charge to it, I think, well, this is the reality of it. Once I do that, I put on a lens 
then I start looking for all the evidence around me to, to prove how right I am because there's a chemical component to certainty. And so when you feel certain about something, you get a release of a chemical like dopamine. It gets kicked into your brain. It feels good to be right. So this is why many times we argue to the death of a relationship because we need to be right. And so we live our life hoping to be right because there's a lens in there telling us what we should be right about. And when you find out that you're right, what that means. And the fact of the matter is, is it means nothing. That none of it has any meaning until I tell myself that I do. And so we took the conversation to how my daughter Addison sees her younger sister Kennedy and what it means when Kennedy goes into her room and she doesn't want her to. And I said, well, what do you make up about that? And so we had this really great conversation. And as I started explaining what are called paradigms to her and lenses, I actually used these things, which I don't know if you guys have ever seen me use before. You've got but these basically are the in your back pocket all these, the time. I carry them with me all the time. <laughs> Because I, I showed my daughter that how you look at something, you, you see through this lens, right? And the difference is that someone else is wearing a very different set of lenses. And so you could be looking at something. I'll tell you, I didn't plan on doing this, but I'm going to do it just for explanation's sake. You can be looking at something like this white sheet of paper. If she's looking at this white sheet, are you going to put them on? Oh, hey, If she's let's do looking that. at this white sheet of paper through blue lenses, and I'm looking at this white sheet of paper through gray lenses. What color do you think I see? Well, I see gray. What color does she see? She sees what? Blue. What color? Blue. Now, here's the question, right? Is this white? Yes. Is it gray? No. Is it blue? No. But we both see it as the color based on whatever lenses we have on. And so how you see yourself, you see through a lens. How you see relationship, you see through a lens. How you see trust, you see through a lens. And what changed the way that I lived my life was realizing that we have thousands and thousands and thousands of sets of lenses. And most of the time, we have no idea where those lenses came from. And that's something that can be profoundly impactful for you in your life. When you're having a conversation, when you're engaged in some sort of interaction with another human being, is that you are looking at it through a specific set of lenses. And most lenses, the thing that's so powerful about lenses, is that most lenses that determine your behavior are lenses that you do not know are there. And so I look at my life as it pertains to trust and commitment and love and loyalty and, and relationship all through very different lenses. So every single circumstance, I have a lens. Any definition I have on a word, I have a lens. And so how I define integrity is simply my lens. How I define possibility is my lens. And so what happens in relationship is a lot of times that we're looking at the exact same thing. We're just looking at it through completely different lenses. And so if I don't have to be right about my lens, then I'm willing to do the work of moving one lens over and trying another lens until I find one that serves me in having peace, having joy, feeling courage, feeling abundance, feeling like I can you know, make things happen. Um, that's a very different lens to put on because naturally I don't think that's the lens we have after a certain point in our life where we've had other people speak into our life and tell us that money's really hard to have. It's very hard to grow. It's hard to, to earn. It's, it's hard to, to save. It's all these things. We, we believe those things. And so we start wearing those lenses. And after you believe that, you start looking for all these things around you to justify that. And that can be, the, it, it, it can be the, the Achilles heel of the possibilities in our life. And so we had a great conversation I did with my 10 year old the other night she took the lenses from me. She took them. She goes, can, can I hold these for a minute? And I said, sure. And she said, you know, she goes, the ones that you feel so much with, she said, it's like they're nailed to your head. And I said, like, which ones? And she said, like, the one that my sister shouldn't go in my room. And I said, so it's hard to take that one off. And she says, yes. And I said, this is what's called the work. I told her, I said, Addison, if you're willing to do the work in your life, of finding lenses that serve you and having better relationships, then that's where your power's at. We have, our trainings are called Emerge. And on our t-shirts, it says Emerge, and it says, worth the work. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, I said, well, what does it say on the shirt? She said, it says Emerge. And I said, what else does it say? And she said, worth the work. I said, do you want to know what the work is? And she said, what? I said, the work in your life is simply being willing to remove lenses and put on different ones and doing something called living in the question. 
And when you're willing to live in the question of what lens can I put on that will serve me, serve my future, serve my gifts, talents, and abilities to be able to help other people, when you're willing to do that work versus the knee-jerk impulse reaction to things that your lenses tell you to have, then you become powerful. Then you can start to say, well, my, wow, maybe I could have a business. Maybe I could write a book. Maybe I could have a really passionate relationship. Maybe I could be in great shape. Maybe I could care, care more about you know, different people. Maybe I could. That's the work. Mm -hmm. Now, if you won't do it, if you won't do the work, then just know that your future is probably already set. And it is set based on what you already believe. And many times in my work with people is that people have no idea why it is they believe what they believe anyway. And they say, well, my dad said this back then, but you don't know why your dad said it. And you don't know why his dad and who he learned from, maybe from his dad or his mom or his great-grandmother. And, and it's like we have all this, this layers and layers of complexities. And the way we break through all of that is that, yes, we can take wisdom, but we have to realize that just because we think something to be true doesn't mean that it's true at all. And so my work every day with teams, family, is getting up and going, all right, how are you looking at this? What could be another lens? And are you willing to dive a little deeper to confront some of those lenses that you may be wearing that are not helping you to make this relationship work, to make your team work, to generate greater income, to get out of where it is you started, to move along the path and evolve your consciousness and your thinking? Are you willing to do that work? Because it's not easy. It's simple when it comes to shifting a lens, but it is not easy. It takes work. Sometimes you laugh. Sometimes you cry. Sometimes you realize that your whole paradigm that you've been living your life through has been wrong. And it doesn't mean that when you find something that's wrong, you beat yourself up. Because if you think you're supposed to beat yourself up, that's just another lens you're wearing. It's a lens telling you this is what you do when you find out you were wrong. That's a lens. You can look at it and go, wow, that belief served me to a point. But moving forward, we're not staying with that belief. That lens, I'll take off. Now, some people say, well, what do you do when you find a lens that doesn't work? You just throw it out. And what I say is absolutely not. You take it and you tuck it in your back pocket. And when there's another situation that comes up, you can say, oh, wait, I can relate to that because I remember when I used to look at it through this lens and this is how I felt when I looked at it through that lens. And so you can actually relate to another human being that may be looking at something very differently than you look at it right now. But then that goes back to the honor of the human condition of just because you see it this way doesn't mean you're stupid. Just because your political views are different than mine doesn't mean you're stupid. Just because you want to wear a mask right now and maybe I don't doesn't mean you're stupid, right? It's like you, people make their decisions based on what they believe is right. And everybody thinks they're right. And when you can get that, then you start going, wow, what is it that I need to be right about right now that could help me to move forward? And so that's a, the groundwork of a two-hour conversation with a 10-year-old. So anyway, <laughs> what are some good ways to train myself to identify my lenses? So Scott, um, I always say that there's two ways to identify lenses. Number one, you got to be willing to look at your behavior. And that means that you step out of your day-to-day -day activity or your pattern that you may have fallen into and look at your behavior. And you look at your behavior and you say, well, I sleep late. That's behavior. Then what you do is you reverse engineer the behavior part and you ask yourself, well, what's the internal dialogue that I have? Which is what's the thinking that's running through my mind? And then the feeling or the emotion that I create with that thinking that then drives the behavior. So there's really two ways, right? And the second way is kind of broken into part A and part B. But the first way is behavior. Many people see their behavior but they don't ever actually assess it and change it or critique it from a different vantage point, mm -hmm. right? And vantage point is one of the things our brain, our brains are very similar in vantage point. If I were to ask you right now to draw a coffee cup on a sheet of paper, you know what you would probably do? You draw a coffee cup from the side. That's what you do. You draw the little coffee cup, the mug with the little handle on the side. Chances are that would be how you do it, right? Very few people when asked to draw a coffee cup, draw a circle, from the top with the little mug, the handle to the mug out to the side. Why? Because typically we have the same vantage point. We see things from the side or a little bit of an elevated up perspective. That's just what our brains typically do. Don't know why that is, but that's the case. Well, when we behave a lot of times, we behave in certain patterns that we don't understand why. So you've got to be willing to look at your behavior and say, well, man, this is what my routine looks like. That's behavior. 
Have I ever asked myself what I think and how I feel that continually drives that behavior that then becomes the pattern? And many times when you'll ask yourself how you're thinking and how you're feeling when you won't engage in a meeting or you, you get really upset at people and you lose your temper, like you don't ask yourself, well, what am I thinking and what am I feeling that's causing that? And the thought part of it has to do with that perspective. Your perspective drives your, your feelings. And so I always tell people that emotion follows focus. Focus is a choice. And so basically, emotion is a choice, meaning, yes, there's knee-jerk reactions to things, but also if you can shift your perspective on something, it fuels a different chemical, a different emotion, and you can start to behave in a very different way and ultimately, through neuroplasticity, change your brain. You can change your brain through certain behaviors, but if you don't assess your behavior and critique it and ask yourself about the thinking and the feeling, chances are that behavior is gonna stay exactly the same. You'll live in the same income level, which is okay if you, you don't wanna change that, that's fine, you can completely love that, but you can change what you do with your money, how you handle your money, but many people don't because they've only seen themselves doing that a certain way. They don't change how they are in a relationship. They don't change communication styles. They don't change their intimacy level. They don't change their passions. They don't, they don't continually upgrade those things because they just don't ever assess themselves. And so when I can look at myself and say, man, how am I behaving? I'm behaving this way. I show up late for meetings. If that's behavior, I got to ask myself, what's going on inside of me that causes me to feel like I should keep being late to meetings? Because there's something within me that I like. There's some payoff I get from showing up late to meetings. And maybe that's the lens that if I show up late, I'm still in control. That nobody can tell me what time to be anywhere. And so what I'll do is I'll show up five minutes late to every meeting just to show everybody that I'm still in control. And it may be sabotaging your career. It may be sabotaging your relationships with your coworkers or your team. But this is what happens. And so through the day, Scott, what you always want to do, look at your behavior. And then just stop, step back and go, wait a minute. It's like watching a play on Broadway. There's all these characters that are playing all these roles. Step back, look at the behavior and go, hmm, how am I thinking in this moment and how am I feeling? And where is all that coming from? Because in that moment, you can make a subtle shift in your next step. And the next thing you know, you behave a certain way. You then see your behavior. You critique it because you're training your brain to critique your behavior and you ask yourself better questions, you find out better answers, and then you have a better quality of life. But if you don't assess what you're doing and step back and live in that question, then things aren't probably going to change for you. Last thing, can I say this? Last say thing it. on this, I will say it. Last thing on say this, it. it is called living in the question, yeah. which means I don't really know anything about myself. That means that I can show up today and go, wow, if I behave that way, can I ask myself a question to figure out what drove that behavior? Sure. Do I lose my temper? Yes. Do I show up late? Yes. Am I always 10 minutes early? Yes. Whatever it is. Do I, I read a lot? Yes. Do I not read a lot? Yes. Whatever it is. Assess that. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself some questions and reverse engineer all that and stay in the question, being open to what you find versus defending what you've already found. Based on, and basically what you found has just been interpreted through all these filters of who you think you are. And this is a mind melter. It's the renewing of your mind when you can say, this is what I think I know. And you know what? I could be completely wrong about it. And so living in that question is saying, well, how can I find a different lens then that might change the experience I'm having in my life? And when you do that, that's called transformation. Without it, all you're doing is living the same life over and over and over and over again. And when I'm in trainings and I've done it around the world, I have people that show up that are doing the exact same thing, thinking the exact same way about themselves, thinking the same way about their relationships, the same way about their future, and nothing changes. And then guess what they get at the end of the day? They get to tell themselves that they're right about how it just can't work for them and how they can't be successful. And that's the payoff. And you have lenses telling you how important it is to be right. But I think you become powerful when you start going, Maybe I'm not right about any of it. Maybe today I just decide what it is I want to create versus reacting to the old story of who it was back then. It's a very different way to live. It is a rabbit hole mm -hmm. and it is challenging and it is scary and it is awesome and it will piss you off, but it will make you excited. It will make you sad, but it can make you happy. Like it's the whole deal. 
It's the most screwed up, horrible, wonderful, amazing, beautiful, terrifying journey ever to live in the question. And this is why most people don't do it, is because they don't want to feel what it is they feel when they become uncertain. Terrorism took certainty from our country when somebody flew planes into those buildings, whoever it was. Terrorism took certainty. Now everybody's looking around going, they could be a terrorist, they could be a terrorist, they could be a terrorist, or COVID-19, they could be a carrier, they could be a carrier, they could be a carrier. And when you're uncertain, guess what? You, you, you're uneasy. And so guess what your brain does? Your brain says, wait a minute, feeling uneasy and uncertain is not good. Mm -hmm. So make up a story really quickly. Make up a story. And it may be a BS story. It may not even be true, but you've made it up. And once you make it up, that becomes your lens. And so then you have a lens against a lens competing with another lens, and you can live your whole life and never become anywhere near what I believe is your potential because you locked onto one lens and you locked out all these other possibilities. And I just refuse to do that in my life. We talk about that. The good thing is, is we've come to that agreement um, and it's, it's a phenomenal way to live and it's really exciting. Life is much more fun that way. It seems to be at least. We, fun, fun, no, it really <laughs> is. It's, it, it's the most beautiful, brutal actually, Brutal and beautiful, it's all at the same time. It's brutal. I've heard that term before. It's brutal. But we started the, what we call the work, and that's where um, our emerge came from is doing the work and uncovering these lenses. We started this 11 years ago. Yep. We started in this work that long ago, and yep. it is a constant every single day uncovering these lenses. And now that we have, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody need some chapstick? We've got some, uh, but we we are in we live in the uncovering of these things, and it is so hard, like you said. But it's it it it's just it's just our way of life now, and there's no turning back. Like once you know, you can't unknow. So you have to continue on that journey, and that's the thing is like there's thousands and thousands and thousands of these lenses, and once you realize that then you can look at it from a much broader perspective, a higher vantage point and go, you know what, it's a lens and I can choose to change it at any time. And then when I change that lens, I gotta put up a different pair of lenses and then I gotta also realize there's a lens behind that lens that I choose, right? Yeah, I mean, so, what, yes. so in choosing a different lens, there's a lens as to why I chose that one. And so you, oh. it's, it's just an uncovering constantly, but looking at it from a much higher vantage point and going, you know what, this is just the work and it's the beauty of the work. Yeah. Is that you get to choose the lenses, you get to you get to take them off anytime you need, and you said put them in your back pocket, and you were you talked about putting them in your back pocket so that you can relate with someone, but I think also putting it in your back pocket so that you know it's there in case you need to look through that lens again for some reason that would serve you. Where it didn't serve you, you take it off, but then you go, you know what, I'm gonna keep it there in case I need it to serve me in this relationship with this person. Yeah, yes, and can I say something because I don't want us to forget. No. It's not, a, <laughs> it's also in how you relate to yourself. And so when you discover, if you're willing to do some work, let's say you jump in and you're like, you know what, I'm gonna start questioning everything that I do, right? I'm gonna question why I get up at the time I do or why I don't. What I tell myself about my career and my money and what I can earn and what I can't earn and what relationships look like and who I need to be in relationships with. Like when you do, right? When you start questioning <laughs> all of that, when you're willing to question all that, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna come up with a new answer. And you go, man, maybe what I've been telling myself is garbage. Now here's where it starts to get tricky. The moment you realize you've been telling yourself something about yourself and you go, wow, this has just been this story, mm -hmm. you have another lens, a protective lens that tells you this is what you do when you discover another lens. This is how you handle it. So just know you may uncover a lens, but there's going to be another lens telling you how you're supposed to handle it. And so you got to do some work on that to then backtrack that and go, well, wait a minute, if this is a lens and there's another lens behind that lens, like... What am I really trying to create here? And that's where you get to a point of absolute organic choice for creation. And that's how you can move your life forward versus letting these things make all your decisions for you. Mm -hmm. And I was taught in the very beginning, one of the first things that I remember from my mentor telling me about lenses and paradigms, he would say that 99, which is a huge number, it's a huge number, mm -hmm. it's a huge number, 99% of the decisions that you say you're making in your life, you are not making. 
Consciously. That's what he said, conscious. Right. He'd say, you think you're making conscious decisions about what you chose. And he would say, well, that's, a, that's true. Consciously, you chose. But it's a belief system that tells you what your options are that you are choosing from. And so when I say, no, I consciously decided to do this one thing. Well, then the question could be is, well, what told you what the options were for doing that one thing? Now, sometimes there are limited options on things, but when you get to the point where it's like, man, there's lots and lots and lots of different options to making income. There's lots of different options on improving your marriage. There's lots of different options to improving your health. There's all sorts of different ways. Then you start getting to a point where you're like, wait a minute, hold up. If there's so many different ways to create different things, then is it really so important that I focus on the ways of doing it? Or do I first just need to get committed and find out what it is that I want to create in my life? Because that's where you start to build from. And that's where you find your power. And so for most people, the work of it is, and, and my daughter Addison and I were talking about, I just started sliding through pictures. I said, Addison, do you see me speaking here? I was like, yeah. I was like, that's the Air Force. She sees all the pictures. I see this. This is me speaking at NASA. You see that? That's where I was at American Express. You see that? That's where I was speaking at a university. You see that? I said, do you know what I'm talking to people about? And she said, lenses. And I said, that's absolutely right. And I said, you know why I get invited back? Because it's so relevant to everyone. Mm -hmm. It is. It's relevant. And when you get it and you start to understand that everything is a lens, then you start to shift things that don't serve you. And I will absolutely confront any BS story that I have about myself that doesn't serve me in being a better husband, being a better, better dad, having better physical health, working myself forward. Because I'm not, I'm not going to stand in the place of, oh my God, I, I just can't afford to do that. Uh, who am I to go travel and see that? Who am I to, to build a business on my own? Who am I to write a book? Like, I'm not an author, but I wrote books. And I have books, right? Like, how does this happen? Well, you start looking at some of the old beliefs you have, and you start going, man, these are so limiting. And they are just constructed from some old perspective with very limited information. Man, that's where you start to change your life. And I think if you want to change the stuff on the outside, you've got to be willing to change what's happening on the inside, which is shifting a lens. And so some people say, Ronnie, I've had a lens on my spouse. I had a lens on uh, uh, my mom, uh, my dad, my, an uncle, a cousin, somebody that I've been carrying so much animosity towards. And in the moment when I just decided to be willing to shift the lens and argue it from a different perspective, all the emotion started to go away. And this is what these things do. They get you locked on to one thing and you can live that the rest of your life. And you can stay there locked on to how much money you think you're supposed to make, where you should live, how your relationships should look, how smart you are, how smart you're not. You know, like I grew up in the South, so guess what? I have a little bit of an accent, right? And there's some people like, oh, people in the South are slow. Like I've, I've heard, oh, doesn't that mean they're slow? I'm like, ah, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's go let's for see. it right now. Let's <laughs> see. Let's, let's have a little bit of a, um, a mental verbal uh confrontation if you want and let's talk about some perspectives on things i'll show you what slow is and then i'll show you what fast is it doesn't and, and i've said that and i had to get out of my head that you know what being southern and having an accent it doesn't mean slow at all it just means different and that was a lens i had to, to break out of so when you go speak at nasa and you're standing in front of a room of rocket scientists you can't go oh yeah i'm slow because i'm from the south you got to dissolve that lens and confront it and say this is just bs i don't know where i got it but I'm confronting that and I'm going to overpower it. I'm putting on a different lens today. And you affirm yourself into a different level of belief about you. And then you're willing to do anything. And at the end of your life, what? Guess what? You tried something and you failed. Big deal. I would rather try and fail than to sit around wondering if I could do it. You know? And, and anyway, that's what lenses do for us. And it's really powerful. I'm just letting you know it's a powerful process. Yep. And it's scary, but it's awesome. It's scary and it's learning to live in a... You learn to find a comfort in the discomfort, knowing that it's that that's just, this, just the way it's going to be from now on. It's part of it. It's part of it's part of our life now, and there's no turning back because we see where it gets us. We see the health that we have between each other, with each other, and with our family, and there's no turning back. There's because it is. It's just a healthier way of life. Yeah. And I feel like we could spend forever and ever and ever on we lenses all, we and you and, well and we you go even deeper into it in the emerge trainings that we do yeah like spend a whole lot of time on that oh, yeah. and we're doing and oh, awesome you guys know can i tell them really quick yeah the end of june we're going to do do emerge virtual it's going to be a five-hour day with me and we're going to talk about 
lenses. We're going to talk about avoiding procrastination. We're going to talk about building structure in your life. We're going to talk about how to communicate better, how to have more courage, how to develop uh, more of the lifestyle, day-to-day -day discipline that you want. Um, we're doing that. So we're going to roll out details yeah, on that we, later. We had, originally, we had originally planned on doing a live event in June here in Scottsdale, but obviously that can't happen yet. Um, the next live one we're planning for September. Yes. So that's great. But now we're going to not replace it, but no. now it's good. Yeah, it's not really a replacement. It's just something awesome that you we know, have now. Yeah, so emerge it's, virtual. It's so gonna be, we're planning uh, planning June 19th, so you can go ahead and mark your calendars for that if you have that day. Okay. It's a Friday. And then, well, last so, question. Let's do that so, one yeah, really we, quick. Um, we'll, yeah, like we could have stayed we forever. Okay. Yeah, um, we rolling. could have stayed forever on that one. It's because it was such a good question. They all were. But, okay, so I think... This one is a really good one leading into from what you were just talking about because you um, were talking about old beliefs, uh, old beliefs of yourself needing to die so that you can emerge into a new person. Mm -hmm. And um, then you also just said a minute ago, affirming yourself into a different belief. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a really good one to go into next. Right. Um, someone shared their story with us about how they kind of grew up from a past with abuse and um, how that led into them not valuing themselves and feeling valued from the people in their past and then also trying to find that value now as an adult. So um, they were wondering about creating and curating self-value now mm -hmm. and then how to set boundaries as a form of honoring and valuing yourself. Okay. Is that, did you understand the question? Um, they asked about that, so okay. yes. So, so I just kind of gave the backstory a little bit okay. um, so as the to why they're is, asking this question. How do you create value for yourself? Create value for yourself. And, the they, and there was also a mentioning of blind spots. And you normally talk about blind spots as in like reaching a goal and how you can become blind to something that could be right in front of you and not, not seeing it because you don't place value on it. So mm -hmm. that this person wanted to know how do you place value on yourself how can I place value on myself now as an adult with this past? And then now how do I set boundaries once I place a value on myself? How do I set boundaries so that other people or other things can you know, yeah, that's a lot. honor those boundaries? I know that was a lot. That no, was a lot to get to those that question. but No, I don't mean so a lot from you. But it is. But the question, there's just so much to that. So question. let me give you a few things really, really quickly about yourself. This is old perspectives on, let's say, monetary value of yourself. Like, think about that. So if I were to ask you, would you take a million dollars for your right arm? you probably say, well, no. Wouldn't take a million dollars for my right arm. I'd say, well, would you take a million dollars for your left arm? No. Well, there you go. You're worth two million bucks right there. How about your left leg? Uh, there's, no, three million. Right leg, no, four million. Now you're four million dollars. Monetary value right there. Like, let's just say from that standpoint, that's one thing. Look at your own value. Um, the complexities of your brain, what your brain can do. Your brain can do far more than any other machine on the planet. It does so much. The, the power, the energy from your brain uh, can light a light bulb. Your brain uh, it fuels your heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, tells them all what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Um, very powerful thing. But your heart beats 100,000 times in a day. Um, trillions of cells in your brain. Um, there's so much you could look at just from the sheer awe of the human body and the human brain. When somebody's like, well, I just don't feel valuable. It's like, man, look at what all you've been given. Like, you know, anyway, I, I heard a quote the other day. It goes alongside this with it. A, a, a machine can take the place of 50 average men, right? That's just the quote. A machine can take the place of 50 average men, but no machine can take the place of one extraordinary man. Right and extraordinary, how you see yourself is everything to do with your own personal lenses. And at some point, when you decide, well, um, the story of me not being very valuable, uh, that that's just made up based on something I saw, how I interpreted it at that time, and now I have this construct called a paradigm in how I see and value myself. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you build more value for yourself? Well, first things first, you got to do in building value for yourself. You one have to realize, in a sense, that you are valuable, just even from the monetary standpoint of, of what I just said, and that you have to see in your future, for a moment, what you could possibly become. Meaning, you could magnify all the things that could be possibilities for you. And when you think about giving yourself time to dream and stand in a place of possibility, just for a moment, possibility, just for a moment, Give yourself permission and the courage to dream for just a moment. The moment you do that and you feel something that anchors within you and you go, 
wow, that felt really good. I could potentially do that, right? Standing for the possibility, not leaning on the predictions that you have of your future based on these. The moment you give yourself the permission to dream and you find something that makes sense for you, then you start to build boundaries around that possibility. And so the possibility is that, you know, I could be in better shape. I could feel better about myself. Like this is a big one for so many people. For some people it's not. For other people it's like, okay, I could be financially independent. I could be financially successful. I could have a career up here. The moment you give yourself that possibility of dreaming and you dream and you anchor to one, then you build a boundary around it. You see, if you build a boundary but you don't have anything for it to protect, then you start to look like a control freak that, that is, is rude or, or controlling or mean to someone. But the moment you say, wait a minute, I'm setting boundaries to protect something because I'm going to hold this accountability to that possible future self, then you're okay with putting up boundaries because you realize the value of you, value of a dream, value of your future. And if there's anything that you and I have that is so unbelievable, that unbelievably value, valuable, it's our future. And so when you create some vision and then you decide you're going to be accountable to that vision, then you build some boundary around it. And that's where you start to protect the vision. And a lot of times, and, and there's an, a scripture, I think it's, it's Old Testament, that says without vision, people perish. Like, I think that's a proverb. Mm -hmm. And it, it means that without a clear picture of what's possible for you, your hopes and your dreams, they start to die. Your motivation starts to die, right? Your inspiration starts to die. Your spirit starts to die. And so what do you have to do? You got to give yourself some permission to dream. And the moment that you get that idea of a dream of what it could be and then build some boundaries around it and protect it, then you have accountability to that thing. And when you hold accountability to something, you take one little step towards it every single day. And over time, over time, you become more like the vision or the dream that you had. And then that's the, that's the best starting point that you could possibly have to build from. The reason people don't start building anything new is that all they're focused on is how things used to be and how old it was and, and what was back then. You know, this is what I was good at back then. These were my strengths back then. These are my weaknesses back then. And now, you know, um, because of the pressure of these situations and the challenges and the stresses, um, I'm going to default back to believing something that I used to believe because at least that'll be something that I can control. I can't control the chaos of the future and the possibilities of the future, and I've got to be in control. So what can I control? Well, I can control the past narrative in a past story. And I can keep revisiting that story over and over and over again. And guess what? That's me controlling something in my life. But when I go, hey, possibility of the future, right? Possibility picture of me becoming better at that thing and then putting some boundaries around it. You don't let things into your life as often that can pull you away from that accountability. And I've said it many times before, distractions don't pull you away from your goals. They only reveal what your deepest commitment really is. And so if I set up boundaries, what I'm doing is I'm protecting a commitment. And if I say, you know what, I'm, I'm committed to becoming better, then I put up boundaries around it. And that's how you start to build more and more value in your life. And if a person says, well, I just don't think I'm valuable because of all the things that I went through, would you tell a kid that? Would you tell a kid just because a child was born to a family that's had difficulties, problems, adversity, maybe, maybe poverty, would you tell that kid you're not valuable? Absolutely not. You take a dollar bill, it crumble it up. It's the old saying, take the dollar bill, you crumble it up. Is it still worth a dollar? Absolutely. So are we. Maybe we get to start again every single day with just a little bit more information and a little more insight versus being so locked on to some old belief. And so in that, you start to emerge into a new creation and you wind up practicing yourself into a new level of being. And whether we want to admit it or not, we're always practicing something. You're either practicing the old version of yourself or you're practicing a new version of yourself, right? Either way, you're practicing and you become, in a sense, perfect at what you've practiced. It's like we become masters of these old paradigms because we keep revisiting our old stories of, well, this is how my family was, and so I guess this is who I am. You know, this is how I was back then when there was pressure or challenges, so I guess that's who I am right now. And it's just absolutely made up. And it's a huge ego trip to think you're not valuable. It's a huge ego trip because you're not right about any of it, really. You know, I told my daughter Addison, we were having that talk the other night. I said it was Henry Ford's quote. Whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. So what's, what are you going to choose to be right about? How you're not valuable? You want to be right about that? Awesome. Go not be valuable. Or do you want to choose that you could be valuable? Is that what you want to be right about? 
then choose to be right about that. Either way, good job. You're going to be right. So make up something that serves you. Now, choosing to believe you're valuable and stepping out there and putting yourself on the firing line, so to speak, putting yourself out there with a gift, a goal, a dream, a book, whatever that could be, you may get rejected and people might laugh at you. But you know what? At the end of your life, I don't know that that's going to matter so much. I don't think it's going to matter so much whether somebody ridiculed you or laughed at you. I think as we move towards the end of our life, we start going, man, did I do what was in my heart to do? Yes or no? And I think that's the thing that we need to remember is if there's something in there that you can stand for, you stand for it. And you say, you know, damn the consequences, right? It's like, I'm going for it. I don't care. I'm going for it. And when you do that, you, you start to become more and you start to realize that when you go for it, when you really stretch for it, the right people that you were so afraid would leave your life, the right people start to show up and they come alongside you and they support you in becoming more. And that's what I've seen in my life. That's what we've seen. And it'd be very easy for any of us to start justifying and rationalizing why it is we can't be successful or why we can't create success or that we're not valuable. It, it's easy. The moment you believe either of them, you're going to be able to find truth to support that. What you look for, you find. And, and, and last thing on this, I'll just tell you, here's what your lenses do. Your lenses blind you to things that will cause you to be uncomfortable. And so you can go, well, I shouldn't do that today because if I go exercise, it's not going to feel good. And it's hard. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to feel that pain. So your brain goes, yeah, there's probably not enough time for you to work out anyway. So then you don't, you don't make the time. You don't find the time. And so then guess what happens? Because you didn't deal with the pain and push yourself into the discomfort, you start having a lens that you start to regret opportunities that you missed out on. And when you carry a lens of regret, that one is more painful long term than the pain of addressing the sharp challenge, the pain that comes in the moment, the immediate pain. That, that one, most people run from, but they're okay wearing a lens that causes them to feel like they aren't becoming enough, that they aren't capable of doing more. And you, if you wanna look at those two lenses, I promise you, you gotta take the sharp pain of it. Because otherwise, this old lens, this one that you can carry telling you you're not enough, man, it'll wear you out. It'll beat you down and you don't even like yourself when you look in the mirror. And I just don't, I don't think that's the best version of us. Doesn't mean it's wrong. Doesn't mean if a person looks in the mirror and doesn't like themselves that they are wrong or that they are bad or they are not valuable or they're not amazing, whatever. But it's just a lens, it's just a story, it's just a narrative and whatever you decide to talk to yourself about and say about yourself, you're gonna be right about. You gotta be very careful of who you allow to talk to you about you. And so I'm very careful of who it is that I let speak into my life because I know that lenses are always being shaped and formed in my brain. It's called neuroplasticity. If you're not careful, seeds of doubt and fear get planted in your mind all the time. And the next thing you know, you're living a fearful life because you let somebody plant those seeds in your mind. But when you say, you know what? Boundaries, not letting that in. You start to stay more in your lane. You move forward towards something compelling and awesome. That feels pretty good. That feels pretty good. And in my experience of working with so many people, uh, that's what I would say is one of the most profound things that can happen. If somebody gives themselves permission to dream for something big, then sets some boundaries, holds themselves accountable to it, next thing you know, good stuff happens. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Are we, we, how long are we on? Oh, we're 10, goodness gracious. 611, is that 6 right? 611. That's all right. Oh, that's my right. sister just showed up, my sister. Hey, Tara. Tara. That's my Look at that, Tara. You see that right there? Oh you know, that's my what that gosh. Is. Don't, don't doubt it. Shout it. I love you. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> hi, Tara. I know. I know. So, so um, I, um, I was actually wrong. I just thought a minute ago, we started this work. Did I just show um, my bicep? You did. We have a delayed version right down here just to make sure that we see everything's still going okay. <laughs> and right. he just got that little image of, do I need to show him mine? No. I'm just kidding. Yours is better than mine. Intimidating. Okay. So anyway, I was wrong. We started this work when I was about 23. Okay. So it's been more than 11 years. Okay. Because Addison's almost 11. Yep. But anyway, and I am always and forever grateful for this work. And I'm grateful for you. And I'm, I'm grateful for you guys and the vulnerability that you show when you ask these kind of questions. Because that's what it's all about. We will not grow. We will stay stagnant. 
if we do not ask the questions and live in the question and stay vulnerable and to open to possibilities of where we can become more vulnerable in certain things. And that's what we are constantly in conversation about and how we can be vulnerable, how we can be raw, and it sucks and it hurts really bad, you know, at times. But just keep going and stay there. Allow yourself to stay there for a little while. And it's, it's not going to feel good. Just like with exercise, like you said, you're going to look for ways to get out. You're going to find those chicken exits is what we first heard it called as a chicken exit. You're going to find a way out of getting into the discomfort. Like get distra Like you can become distracted. Like I'll sometimes go, well, I should go do this, but you know what? I got to go fold this laundry. You know, And that's just one of these saying, you know what? That work that you really needed to do, these show up. Now you got to go fold laundry. And that work that I needed to do didn't get done. So that is my, and it's uncomfortable, like this is what I was just saying, like when you were talking just a few minutes ago about holding on to your story and it, you feeling in control because it's familiar, then feeling out of control is scary. Mm -hmm. So do you feel out of control when you let go of that story? You go, I don't have anything to cling to now. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's no man's land, yeah. right? That's what we, or no woman's land. No man's land is where you've moved away from some old story that you have, but you're not into the new place of creating something new with it. And so you're literally out there. You're, it it's kind of feels like you're space. floundering. And right. there's a quote that I read in, in a, it was a Harvard Business Review book that said, uh, transition always feels like failure when you're right in the middle of it mm. because you are in that place. Mm. Mm, so mm. good. So good. That was good. <laughs> so good. Um, but, you know, it does. You get out in the middle of something and you're not used to it. You haven't been there before. It's no man's land. Yeah. And so guess what your brain starts telling you to do? Start check telling out. you to check out, go back, quit. Yeah. And there's all sorts of different ways to quit. One of the things we do in the Emerge training is called the threshold. And, you know, there's all these different responses to what I call the threshold. And the threshold is the vetting of the next level. And that if you won't deal with the threshold, you're not going to arrive at the next level in any area. We won't. I don't. You don't. She doesn't. I mean, this is just how it is. So, you know, when you hit the threshold, then what happens is your brain starts to go, oh my gosh, this is really uncomfortable. And this means something's wrong. You must not be doing it right. So here's how you respond. And you run back. You quit. You stop. You, you flip over to some other activity that's busy. And, you know, I always say it's the four-letter words, like busy, stop, yeah. quit. That's what we do. And so uh, the lens component of it and being willing to look for things that support a new narrative um, is really what I think the work for all of us is about. And it leads to a better destination. Hands down, it's a better destination. And um, I think you were put here for a purpose. I believe I was put here for a purpose. I believe that we have gifts and talents and abilities, and no matter what the circumstances or the situation might be that's happening around us at any time, um, we get to choose the narrative. We get to choose how we interpret it. We get to choose how we assess it, and um, that's where the power's at. And so if you're willing to do that work, then amazing. Um, if you're not willing to do the work, then that's amazing too. You, you get to choose how you're gonna do it. But in, in my humble yet accurate opinion, I think, that the, I think the best way to do it is to go, hey, this one thing could matter to me, build some structure around it, and then attack it, get after it. And you start to see yourself become something that is, is really more powerful maybe than you were before. And man, that feels good. And I don't think there's anything wrong with feeling good about who we are. I just don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with feeling courageous and bold and being like, you know what? It's my life. I'm going for it. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. And we just did our podcast, and I, and I cited, it was Helen Keller. She said, you know, blind, she can't hear, she can't speak. Helen Keller said, life is a daring adventure or nothing at all. And if you think about that quote, like this is a person that couldn't hear, couldn't see, right, couldn't speak. Life is a daring adventure or nothing at all. Like that's pretty, that's pretty bold. And so instead of letting some of the old stuff, those 99% of that residue run us, um, I think the renewal part of our mind and what's possible, um, it can fuel us into stepping into something more. And um, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And I think we deserve that. I really do. You deserve that. We deserve it. I deserve it. That's a lens. And when you realize you deserve something, not entitled to it, but you deserve it, um, you can really step forward and into something new. So, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. And by the way, if you guys don't listen to my podcast, our podcast, it's, it's well, I used to say my podcast, but you're on it. She was just with it on us. Um, it's on Spotify. 
and on iTunes, uh, iTunes and even YouTube yeah. and um, Google Play and iHeartRadio. Is that right? Is yeah. Still, yeah. Yeah. And so it's on there. You can check that out. We, we put a lot of cool content out there. You know, it's called Emerge. <laughs> the Emerge Podcast. Yeah. It is what it's called. It is. Yeah. Of course that's what it's called. Uh, anything else before we go? Six. Yes, I have a couple of things. Okay. Mark your calendars for the 19th. If you're, we'll have more information available. June 19th. And how, June 19th, yes. More information available about that soon. Some of the details and all that. We got to work out first before we put it out there into the world. Um, but end please, of June. Yeah, end of June. Right, 19th yep. or... Around that time, yeah. Yeah. So, that's there. And then um, you can mark your calendars for this Saturday if you want. And, like, bake a cake for yourself. Put on a party hat. Get those little, like, what are those things that go, when you blow? What does it do? <laughs> I don't know what they're called. <laughs> anyway, so this Saturday is wow. my birthday, and we're going to be here again. That's going to be my birthday. Yeah, please be birthday. here with us Saturday at 7 a.m. Pacific time, 10 Eastern. It's your birthday. Yes. It's so your birthday. be with us again here, and we're going to hit on some more of these questions we have Many more that we are hopefully going to get to, get to in the next one. If not, maybe the next one. And if you have questions or anything that you want to ask or topics that you want touched on, please send. We, if we don't get to it here, we could get to it in a podcast, if anything, you know? Yes. So, yeah, do that. Mark your calendars for June 19th and this Saturday. Okay. Go ahead and bake yourself a cake for me. Or bake a cake. And show up. For, and show up with... And let's with, party. Let's, let's party. How old are you going to be? 29 again. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait till you get 30. Can't right. wait till I'm 30. Nah. I'm excited about 30 for you. I'm excited about... It's your birthday. 30 yep. for me. 36, actually. Go, Jenny. It's, it's your, your birthday. birthday. Yes, it is. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. That's, that's going to be a good day. That'll be uh, this coming Saturday. Oh, yeah. tell them again. Time again is... 7... 7, 8. Yeah, we backed it up one hour. Pacific. 7 Pacific. Yes. 10 Eastern. On Saturday. So, and we'll, you know, if you... Yes, in the morning. Yes. Saturday morning. It's going to be your birthday. <laughs> it's going to be a party. What? It's p.m. We're going to take you guys out for the evening. It's 7 p.m. No, it's a.m. Oh, we should take the the, <laughs> the Facebook Live to a date night. A date night? Facebook Not Live? Not happening. Not happening. Hey, I mean, we're Hey, open. <laughs> we might do some Facebook Live and show you where we're at. We're going we're gonna to go to dinner and stuff. Oh, That'd be my. cool. Alrighty, well, we anyway. won't hold you guys up. No, we won't hold you up anymore. Hey, thank you guys for being on, and uh, you're awesome. Thanks for all the questions. You guys keep sending them in. Are you telling them to direct the email or? or oh, you how? can you can message us on so socials, or <laughs> I'm gonna point so that you can get it. Um, email us at info at dosteam.com if you have anything at all you want to share, or you can just send us a message on any of the socials. And on your socials, speaking of, share this. That would be amazing. That's because right. If sure. Everybody in your in your world and in your circle could hear and understand these concepts. Could you imagine what it would do for your relationships? You know, I mean, that's all there is. Yeah, so. it's contribution, right? So yeah. just just doing that, sharing into people's lives. So mm -hmm. this Saturday, seven a.m. Pacific time. Yep. It's your birthday. It's my birthday. We're gonna do a Facebook Live. Uh, if you guys oh, share this, we? that would be awesome. And any questions, email us info at DOS Team. Stop doing that. Info at dosteam.com. Tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Love God you bless guys. you guys. You're amazing. Yes. Talk to y'all later. See you. Bye. Bye.